something is not right. October 1961, and the Museum of Modern Art in New York City opens their latest exhibition, the final works of artist Henri Matisse. The exhibit includes Le Bateau, a vibrant impression of a sailing boat, but something is not right. After weeks on display, one woman notices an artistic anomaly, and she points out that the boat's reflection is more complex than the boat itself. The explanation was absurdly simple. You see, the MoMA had hung Le Bateau upside down, and almost no one noticed. This case in many ways parallels an ongoing shift in my field of research. I'm a microbiologist in the Finley lab at the Michael Smith Laboratories, and I study interactions between the nervous system and microbes. Recently, researchers have demonstrated that gut microbes profoundly influence our brain and behavior. And this challenge is a top-down model in which the brain largely controls the body and the microbes within. So like the MoMA, I found my own perspective reversed. You see, we live in a microbial world. Throughout our lives, we're introduced and colonized by many different microbes. In fact, trillions of microorganisms, far outnumbering the stars of our galaxy, reside within our digestive tracts, forming the gut microbiota. Now, these microbes contribute to everyday bodily functions. For example, the gut microbiota promotes digestion by breaking down complex and otherwise indigestible carbohydrates, produces key vitamins, metabolizes specific drugs, and even influences immune functions. Studying about a microbial community not as disease-bearing germs, but rather as something beneficial, fascinated me. And so when I learned that bacteria could benefit the brain, I was hooked, and I caught the research bug. So I want to give you kind of my own nerdy example in why I think it's so incredible that microbes modulate the mind. If I were to take a human body and stretch it out as big as possible so that one gut microbe is roughly chylinda sized, the distance between the gut to brain for this gut microbe would be approximately like communicating from Vancouver to Vegas. But just like I use phone calls and text messages and emails, Bugs in the brain utilize a variety of signaling systems. Collectively, these form the gut microbiota brain axis. Now, this is a very new field, and we're still trying to figure out the precise mechanisms involved, but identified key pathways that link bugs and brain. And today, I'll share three lessons that I've learned from exploring our gut-brain connection. Lesson number one, expand and occasionally flip your perspective. For centuries in Western medicine, the human brain has been this ultimate mastermind, the organ that makes you, you. An adult brain is comprised of approximately 100 billion neurons um, that are linked together through synapses or these connections. Neurons release chemical messengers, neurotransmitters, at the synapses, and these regulate different brain signalings. So it's the neurons and the neurotransmitters that form this complex web this basis of nervous function. Now let's expand this perspective. Now, of course, the nervous system isn't uh, completely limited to the brain. We have peripheral nerves that spread throughout our body, but it's, the, it's this connection between our gut and brain that is most important. Our gut and brain are linked by something known as the vagus nerve. Now, a nerve can carry information from the brain or towards the brain. And our vagus nerve is primarily composed of the fibers that are sending information towards the central nervous system, suggesting that this might be an important system in gut talk. So let me tell you a little bit about this study. Here, researchers used rodents, and they treated them with probiotics, that is, specific beneficial bacteria. Now, when the mice received this probiotic treatment, their anxiety-like and depressive-like behaviors decreased. But these benefits weren't found in mice who had a severed vagus nerve. Moreover, our gut is this neurotransmitter factory that's powered by microbial management. I'll give you a couple examples. For instance, serotonin. Now, serotonin is popularly recognized as this neurotransmitter that's involved in feelings of happiness. In actuality, serotonin regulates a diverse uh, grouping of biologic functions, including our memory and also gut activity. In fact, more than 90% of your body's serotonin is localized inside of your gut. 
Here it's produced by specialized cells known as the enterochromaffin or EC cells. And a group of scientists wanted to figure out whether EC cells were involved in the production of serotonin. To do this, they studied germ-free animals. Now, a germ-free model has been raised without any microbial exposure, and therefore they lack a microbiota. The researchers found that germ-free animals produce less intestinal serotonin. However, when these mice were colonized by a diverse group of microbes, serotonin levels dramatically increased. But how? Researchers found that metabolic products from bacteria increase the serotonin synthesis genes in the EC cells. Basically, the bugs are telling the EC cells, hey, it's time to produce serotonin here. But bugs themselves can actually directly impact neuroactive compounds, like gamma aminobutyric acid, or GABA. So in the brain, this is the second most abundant neurotransmitter. And like serotonin, it's involved in how we feel. With this gut, certain bacteria, like this Bacteroides fragilis, produce GABA. And here it helps promote the growth of other intestinal microbes. But does gut GABA actually influence us? Well, perhaps. Scientists use fMRI scans to examine the brains of patients with major depressive disorder. Brain signatures that were linked with depression were also associated with low levels of GABA-producing bacteroides. Now, this is only a correlative finding, but this project and other studies certainly seem to indicate that microbes may play an important role in how we feel and how we behave. But it's not just mood. You know, bugs can actually regulate a variety of our brain's functions, and I'm interested in how microbial communities might influence our brain's immune response. Developing a gut-brain project affirmed a second lesson, valuing voices. So I want to explore this lesson by examining a hypothetical situation. What would it look like if Matisse portrayed a microbial community? Maybe something like this. Here's a simple microbial community comprised of two members. I've separated them for convenience sake. Now let's add a third microbe to that mix. What might happen? Well, we can have different scenarios. Maybe it could look something like this. Here's a simple community comprised of just two microbes. I've added a third for convenience sake. Now let's examine potential outcomes. Well, for instance, in scenario A, not much happens. If a microbe doesn't settle in the gut, it is efficiently swept through, and it's quite literally flushed away, maybe in a couple hours from now. All right, you could have another alternative where the new microbe outcompetes the original inhabitants. There's also a third possibility where you have all three microbes living in roughly equal proportions, or a scenario where a microbe might impact one member but not the other, like in scenario D. Now, of course, these are only snapshots in a spectrum of microbial responses. But just like we have four unique portraits, different microbial communities likely exhibit distinct functions. We need to value our voices. Knowing who's there and what they're saying is a key challenge in microbiome research. Of course, our gut microbiota is far more complex and is always going through alterations, just in our matisified example. We can kind of think about this as this dynamic orchestra whose melodies modulate through time it is often the first notes that are most critical to understanding or even recognizing a piece of music. So I'm interested in how early life microbial exposures might impact the brain's later functions. Now, I have applied the lessons of the microbiota to my own life and research. For me, valuing voices not only refers to the microbial community within, but also guidance from my diverse and collaborative team. To critically examine the gut-brain connection, I've partnered with researchers from the Javan Moafagian Center for Brain Health, and together we're examining a connection between microbes and microglia. Now, these are your microglia. They're specialized immune cells found in your brain and brainstem, and they have these long processes that reach out, constantly surveying the environment. When microglia sense something's not right, the processes can move towards damage to prevent further injury. And here they're in charge of our brain's immune responses. I think they're pretty incredible cells. Now, during prolonged chronic stress, microglia actually change shape. They retract their processes, adopting this activated or immune-ready form. 
So our team studies a form of chronic stress that's unfortunately rather prevalent around the world. And this is childhood malnutrition. So prolonged childhood malnutrition actually leads to impaired uh, brain responses and improper microglia activation. You see in a system of diverse voices, there's always the possibility of dissonance. And microglia alterations have been linked to a variety of neurologic conditions, from depression to multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's disease. And we need to explore still more. We hope that by examining our gut-brain connection, we can potentially someday identify potential therapies or microbial uh, targeted treatments, or even just better understand what is healthy brain function. Now this leads me to the third lesson, acknowledging interdependency. See, our microbes depend upon us to live and thrive, and we should care for this community. We can actually shape it. A balanced fiber-rich diet, exercise, even a strong social network have been shown to shape the composition of the microbiota. But just like our microbes depend on us, we also depend on our microbes, from anything to how we eat to what we think. And this has led to this model of the meta-organism. Now in this framework, a human or an individual is not only the visible host, but also the microbial community within. Amazingly, what makes me, me, involves both myself and my microbes. Now let's go back in time. While Henri Matisse develops his, his distinct abstract technique, astronomers and physicists turn to the stars. Edwin Hubble observes the first evidence that galaxies grow. And this led to this huge paradigm shift in our concept of the cosmos. No longer did life exist in static space. Bam. We are part of the expanding universe, a universe in constant motion, captured by the abstract expressionism of Matisse and his contemporaries, perhaps portrayed earlier still in the swirls of a starry night. Now, a similar paradigm shift is happening to our understanding of the human nervous system. You see, you also contain an expanding universe. In the beginning, there's egg and there's sperm. And in the months following fertilization, your nervous system develops in a safe and protective environment. And then birth, and welcome to the microbial world. We know that the following years form a critical foundation to our brain development. Hugs and kisses from parents and pets, high fives, handshakes, experiencing new places, new foods, discovering new knowledge. All of these experiences are important for brain development but they also act as moments of microbial exchange. As we explore and connect with the world, our gut microbiota dramatically responds. And it's not impossible to consider how the maturation of the microbiome, and by extension, its neurologic potential, might influence your own brain development and function. But our gut-brain connection, it doesn't end in childhood. We grow. The mysterious microbial and mind-altering processes that form us sail onwards. We're made wise by new perspectives, shaped by many voices, wonderfully unique, yet securely interdependent. Lights launched into the expanding universe. After all, your brain is more than human. Thank you.